Hello and welcome to the Outsider Art Podcast, Episode 13, Mini Evans. On Good Friday 1935, at age 43, Minnie Evans did a doodle, filling a page with some, quote, funny things. The following day she did the same. These pages were then stored away, and it was not until five years later that she discovered them within the pages of a magazine she was about to burn. They were dated and titled, My Very First and My Second. With this fortuitous discovery, she would embark upon a lifelong journey of art making that was both compulsive and necessary. For Evans, the creation of her art was more than a passing fancy or an entertaining frivolity. They were a realisation of her dreams and visions and an unconscious exploration of all that dwelled there. When you hear a voice telling you to, quote, draw or die, as Evans claimed, what other choice did she have? Evans reveals in the fascinating documentary The Angel That Stands By Me that she was essentially commanded by an angel by her side to paint and draw. She has been called an unconscious surrealist by critic Barbara Rose and an innocent surrealist by her friend and supporter, Nina Howell Starr. But, if we are to apply a label, I would venture a little further and call Evans a pure surrealist. For she had no need to induce dreams and visions. They came to her unasked for, and their realisation as art was genuinely automatic, with Evans claiming, quote, I have no imagination, I never plan a drawing, they just happen, end quote. Not only did they just happen to her, but she also said of her artworks that, quote, When I get through with them, I have to look at them like everybody else. They are just as strange to me as they are to anybody else, end quote. And when you look at the work of Evans, she has a point. They are full to bursting with imagery. Floating faces, religious beings, vivid flora, patterns and a multitude of colours. A quasi psychedelic realm, which, while not easily interpreted, is undoubtedly unique, appealing and strange. Evans's work is uplifting, vibrant and for the most part positive and full of vitality. Unlike many of the artists that I've talked about so far in the Outsider Art Podcast, Evans's work is full of beauty for beauty's sake and alive with joy and light and spiritual optimism, a paradise of mystical visions. They are less works of explicit message and meaning, but that doesn't mean that they are without force. Her art is deeply evocative from an emotional perspective, more about awakening feelings than provoking intellectual musings. Of Trinidadian slave ancestry, Minnie Eva Jones was born on December 12, 1892 in Long Creek, North Carolina, USA. Her young mother, Ella, only 14 at the time of her birth, was working as a domestic servant and her father, also very young, abandoned the family and passed away when Minnie was a teenager. At two months, Minnie was taken to live with her grandmother, Mary Croom Jones, who raised her, with her mother becoming more like a sister figure. The family moved to Wilmington, and Minnie stopped attending school at the sixth grade due to economic necessity. She worked as a sounder, going house to house selling shellfish gathered from the waters of the North Carolina coast. Even at a young age, she was affected by the dreams and waking visions that would remain with her throughout the rest of her life. These dreams and visions had a deeply spiritual aspect to them, a reflection of her strong Baptist faith. She would be a member of the Congregation of St. Matthew AME Baptist Church from 1910 until her death in 1987. 
At the age of 16, Minnie married Julius Caesar Evans. As they were both too young to get legally married, they falsified their ages on the marriage certificate. Both Minnie and her husband were employed in the service of Pembroke Jones. From 1916 to 1918, Minnie was employed as a domestic at Pembroke Park and she continued to work for the Joneses when they moved to Early Gardens. She worked nearly 30 years as a domestic in the service of Jones and when he died worked for Mrs Jones's second husband, Henry Walters, son of the founder of Baltimore's Walters Art Museum. She was to bear three sons, Elisha, David and George, each named after Wall Street millionaires who visited Pembroke Jones's estate to hunt. When Early Gardens was purchased by W. A. Corbett in 1948, Julius was employed as a tour guide and Minnie as a gatekeeper, a job she was to keep until her retirement in 1974. Early Gardens is still open to the public today, and Evans features prominently as part of their history and is remembered in the Minnie Evans Sculpture Garden. Looking at their website, you can see just what an inspiration the gardens were to Evans's art. The 67 acre gardens are alive with a vast array of flora and fauna. After Evans rediscovered her first and second drawings in 1940, she had begun to draw obsessively, often completing multiple works in a day. Her early works were done using Crayola crayons and she made efficient use of all the colours available. She first used oils in 1943, but continued also working in crayon, watercolour, pencil and inks throughout the remainder of her artistic life. Evans would work on her art while at the Early Gardens Gatehouse, and would show interested visitors her work, sometimes selling them her pieces. She became good friends with Wilmington lawyer George Roundtree Jr., who encouraged her work. In 1961, Evans held her first exhibition at the Little Gallery in Wilmington. She had only recently begun signing and dating her work, so the chronology of works from the 1940s and 50s are inexact. And it is at this point in our narrative on Minnie Evans that we introduce the discovery part of our story. For yes, just like many of the artists we have discussed, Evans also had a champion who dedicated herself to bringing Evans's work to a larger audience and to more prominence in the art world. In 1962, Nina Howell Starr, a mature photography student at Florida State University, was shown Evans's work by a friend and after initially balking at the multitude of colours, she reassessed them after printing them in black and white and realised their graphic strength. Starr visited Evans that year, with George Roundtree Jr. helping to gain Evans's confidence. This was the beginning of a lifelong friendship between Evans and Starr. Starr wrote and lectured extensively on Evans, as well as promoting and organising exhibitions of her work. She also taped interviews with Evans between 1962 and 1973, which had provided a deep source of information about the artist's life, her process and her inner life of dreams. Starr was largely responsible for taking Evans's work out of the localised Wilmington community and into the larger art world. Starr mentions that at a presentation luncheon for Evans in 1969, that Evans introduced her as, quote, Mrs. Starr, president of my pictures in New York, end quote. I think, most importantly, their relationship was one of a close friendship and absolute trust. Starr would remain loyal to Evans for the remainder of Evans's life on both a personal and professional level. Charles Muir Lovell, in his book Minnie Evans, Artist, talks about Starr's role in promoting Evans's work and summarises her exhibiting history. Quote, After moving to New York in 1964, 
Starr began to represent Minnie Evans's work in the city where Evans later received substantial recognition from galleries, museums and the press. Starr continued to promote Minnie Evans throughout much of the artist's lifetime. Starr never received a commission on the sale of Evans's work, but she served as an advocate for an individual who she believed to be a unique and uncelebrated artistic talent. Nina Howell Starr arranged the first exhibition of Evans's work in New York in 1966, The Lost World of Minnie Evans, which was exhibited at the Church of the Epiphany and St. Clement's Episcopal Church. Starr's advocacy eventually led to larger gallery shows, sales and the solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1975. After Evans's solo exhibition at the Art Image Gallery in New York in 1969, her work was reviewed by Newsweek and other important national publications. In 1972, the National Museum of American Art, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., purchased one of Evans's large collage paintings for their permanent collection. A year later, Jean de Buffet purchased several of Evans's wax crayon drawings from Nina Howell Starr in New York after seeing Evans's work in an exhibition at the Studio Museum of Harlem. A retrospective exhibition in 1986, organised by the North Carolina Museum of Art, Heavenly Visions, The Art of Minnie Evans, curated by Michael D. Cahan, honoured Evans in her home state of North Carolina. Evans's work has now appeared nationally and internationally, and is held in numerous museums and hundreds of private collections throughout the United States. End quote. Evans's work is in the collections of the American Folk Art Museum, the Collection de l'Art Brut, MoMA, the Smithsonian, and the Whitney, to name but a few. One thing that is very clear in the documentary The Angel That Stands By Me, which is available for viewing through the American Visionary Art Museum's YouTube page, is that Evans attracted love and devotion from all who met her. Her open-hearted personality and disarming manner shines through in the documentary, and you can see why people really adored her. Due to failing health, she retired from her gatekeeper role at Early Gardens in 1974, but continued her art practice and exhibiting. She moved into Grottingen Nursing Home in 1984, three years after her mother Ella died at age 102 in 1981. Minnie Evans passed on December 16, 1987, aged 95. Nina Starr, in her chapter Reflections on the Life and Death of Minnie Evans, in the book Minnie Evans' Artist, recounts the eulogy she gave at Evans's funeral. It's a long quote, but I think it effectively summarises the vitality of Evans's spirituality and the unrelenting drive towards doing God's work that she carried throughout her life. Quote, I would tell about Minnie's hearing God's voice. And then I added solemnly, I have a message from Minnie. This is what I told them. Like the boy Samuel in the Bible, when Minnie was a child, she heard a voice calling her by name. Samuel thought the voice he heard was Eli's, but it was God calling him, and Minnie thought the voice she heard was Mama Mary's. But Mama Mary had not called. Years later, Minnie again heard a voice, and she knew it was God. This is how she told it to me. I didn't go to sleep. I didn't have a chance. Just as I closed my eyes, a beautiful light appeared in my room, and the light was in the northeast corner, I am sure. There was a great wreath. I didn't see the wreath, but I saw the shadow of the wreath, and behind the shadow of this wreath is where God spoke to me. He said, I am Jehovah, your God. This light that you see now shall shine around all of you. But you know, I became very happy and had to get out of bed and praise God for that. And God talked to me. I didn't talk back to him, but he talked to me. He gave me that guarantee. 
this light that you see shall shine around all of you. Then he told me, I am Jehovah your God, so I have lived on that ever since. I try to live in a way, let nothing come between me and my Saviour. I pass all little obstacles, all little things that would be crossing. I pass them by. I turn my back on them. I tell them, I've got something to do, you know. God has given me this to do, so I don't have time to fool with things that's not worth anything. Just imagine my neighbours and church members. I hope they will hear this sometime laughing and nudging each other and calling me crazy because I was praying. At this point I stopped and faced the congregation and said with force, These are Minnie's words, and then continued. But my prayer was this, I wanted God to create in me a clean heart. I pray the prayer that David prayed. I want to live the life and pass the life from getting angry at things people say and things people do. I wanted God to create in me a clean heart and then renew the right spirit within me. That's what I prayed for and that's what he did. Since then I know he did because I can bear so much, because I put my trust in God. And I do wish that each and every one of my friends and neighbours would do the same thing. As I closed, I sensed from those friends and neighbours their awed attention and acceptance. In fact, I had felt it also during my reading, as I heard voiced acceptance. My own satisfaction lay in the opportunity, on this moving occasion, to offer Minnie Evans's own words that revealed the depth of her spirituality, candour, and most fittingly, her readiness to defend the integrity of her life. End quote. Nathan Kerner, in Aspects of Minnie Evans, quotes Evans reflecting on a vision that further explains her compulsion to create art. Quote, it was shown to me what I have to do of paintings. The whole entire horizon, all the way across the whole earth, was put together like this with pictures. All over my yard, all upside the trees and everywhere were pictures. And I looked at those pictures, and something spoke within me, said, Minnie, you've got to do this. End quote. I wasn't able to find an accurate number of existing Evans works, and given that she would sell them to visitors to early gardens, some for as little as one dollar, it's unlikely that there will ever be a way to determine how many works she completed in her life. However, based on evidence that she would often complete multiple works in a day, it's likely that there are potentially thousands of works out there, some perhaps hidden away in books and magazines, much like Evans did with her first 1935 drawings. In his paper, Kerner places Evans's work within a broad art historical context that I think rightly spans centuries, cultures and forms. Quote, Artists talk to each other visually across time, space and cultures in ways that transcend the divisions we set up between them. From the perspective of this often mysterious cross-fertilisation, the question of Minnie Evans's status as a so-called outsider artist is beside the point. Rich in implication and imagery, her work invites comparisons to a wide range of art of other periods and cultures. Her ancestry has led writers to identify possible West African and West Indian elements in her work. Such connections are striking. But eventually, one can't help finding formal or conceptual relationships almost everywhere. In early Spanish manuscript illumination, in Giacomo Bala's symmetrical fabric designs of the 1910s and 1920s, in Ethiopian magic scrolls, in tantric art, in works by Philip Taff or even Damien Hirst. 
Evans is a visionary artist in a lineage that includes Blake, Runge, Brisden, Redon, Masson and Pollock, and in a sense, shamanistic artists like Artaud, Voice and Bourgeois, who claim art's magic or exorcising powers as a primary motivation. End quote. Kerner comments further in regards to Evans's symmetrical works, which are some of her most well-known and recognisable. Quote, some Evans' works are symmetrical around both a vertical and a horizontal axis, like mandalas. Evans referred to them as turnaround pictures, meaning they could be viewed in any of the four possible turnings of the rectangle. He continues, Evans's centripetal turnaround drawings imply a free-floating detachment from the edges of the page and from the constraints of wall-mounted presentation. In this, they bring to mind Tibetan and Native American floor paintings or Romanesque ceiling paintings. End quote. Kerner continues later in the article. Quote, the works for which Evans is perhaps best known combine symmetrical abstraction with figurative elements and often take the general form of an idealised head with an archaic smile. Otherworldly in its serenity and usually female or of ambiguous gender, rarely male, it is surrounded by a colourful symmetrical profusion of floral, faunal and abstract forms. Her heads, a generalised type that Evans individuates in many subtle details, can evoke Egyptian Fayum portraits that stare out from antiquity so vividly and individually, and also stylized portraits of the Buddha, Hindu Bodhisattvas or Byzantine icons. He continues, Most powerful are their large staring eyes, but eyes are not confined to the heads alone. They also appear disembodied or attached to other forms, tucked into the wings of birds or butterflies or floral shapes or linked in geometric patterns, and animate the drawings magically. They return our gaze. Evans suggested eyes would represent the eyes of God, and indeed they seem to imply a form of consciousness or unifying life force present in plants, animals, birds as well as humans." End quote. In his paper, Many Evans, Off in the Garden to Talk with God, John Walker Myers writes of a quote Evans gave to Newsweek and uses that as a jumping off point in discussing her work. Being a fan of gardens and gardening, I can appreciate the deep connection that Evans had with both the gardens she worked at and the ones she created in her art. Quote, the key to an understanding of Evans's impetus to create lies in a statement she made in an interview in Newsweek. I love people to a certain extent, but sometimes I want to get off in the garden to talk with God. On one level, Evans was talking about early gardens. On another level, the artist was speaking about the heavenly garden which grew in her fertile imagination. Over the years, the two gardens became one, and the lush imagery of the composite served the artist as a primary vehicle for the expression of her visions and dreams. End quote. Myers concludes his paper with the following thought. Quote, there can be little doubt that many Evans took the earthly beauty of early gardens, the conscious or unconscious contribution of her African heritage, and her firm and unshakable belief that a paradisical garden would be her eternal home with God, and fuse them with her extraordinary visionary gifts to produce compellingly beautiful paintings and drawings. End quote. As Evans herself said, quote, I paint a memorandum of my dream. End quote. I hope that this episode will encourage you all to seek out the work of Minnie Evans, and for those of you with relatives who visited Early Gardens between 1948 and 1974, 
to check the attics and basements on the off chance that there may be a forgotten Evans work squirreled away somewhere. As always, I will put a reading list and links on the episode page on the podcast website at shows.acast.com slash outsider dash art dash podcast. I've kind of given up on the podcast Facebook page becoming a thing at this stage, although it is currently the best place to be able to engage in conversations or let me know about faux pas that I've made, but I'm still trying to organise a comment section on the podcast website that will also serve that purpose. Do follow our Instagram page for notification of new episodes. Just search for Outsider Art Podcast, all one word. I've also joined Love the Podcast, which allows for ease of rating and reviewing. So if you're feeling generous, please go to lovethepodcast.com slash OAP and let others know what you think of the podcast. You can also find this podcast easily on various podcasting platforms by going to followthepodcast.com slash OAP. Right. I think that's enough URLs for one day. I'll put the links on the podcast website. I'm not sure who will be the subject of the next episode. So like this one, it will be a tremendous surprise when it drops. So please join me next time on the Outsider Art Podcast for a tremendous surprise. And thanks so much for listening.